Today, I'm honored to be joined by Mike Bell, the global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. I've been following him for a number of years, so it's a big honor for me. Mike, how are you doing today? Very good, thanks. Perfect, perfect. Well, look, let's get straight into it. We've had some UK inflation data out this morning, uh, dropped to a six-month low, but let's say it's still at unacceptable levels, above 10%. What was your overall takeaway from the reading? Yeah, look, it's obviously welcome that inflation is starting to come down a bit. But I think the sad truth of the matter is it's probably going to take a recession to get inflation down to levels that the Bank of England are comfortable with. You've still got very strong wage growth. And ultimately, that's probably going to keep inflation too high until unemployment goes up. And that then puts downward pressure on wages. I think that's one thing that is maybe puzzling investors, uh, both in the US and in the UK, where we've got this kind of very slow economic growth picture, um, but unemployment is still stubbornly low, whether it's 3.7% uh, in the UK. How do you you know, marry the two? What, what, what you, what's your takeaways from that? I think... What's going on in the UK is interesting because basically the interest rate increases that the Bank of England have been putting through to try and slow the economy down in order to get inflation down uh, are coming through with more of a lag than they have historically. So if you look back historically, the UK tended to be largely on tracker rate mortgages. And then over the last decade or so, the proportion of people on tracker rate mortgages has come down to only about 15% of people. So only about 15% of mortgage holders have actually experienced the interest rate rises that the Bank of England have put through so far. They've obviously been getting hit quite hard by that, given the rapid nature and the significant uh, magnitude of those rises. But what's going to happen this year is that there's still a fair amount of people who are on fixed rate mortgages, but that expire this year. So by our calculations, there's about another 25% of mortgage holders whose fixed rate mortgage expires this year. And they're going to be going from a mortgage rate that was at very, very low levels to something that's now significantly higher. And so I think what's going to happen is that the hit to the economy that the Bank of England have been trying to sort of implement in order to slow wage growth and get inflation down is just coming through with more of a lag than it has historically but i still think it's going to hit and if you look at some of the key lead indicators of late of the labor market there's a survey on jobs that comes out uh, every month and particularly for permanent staff that remains pretty weak so i think you are sadly going to see job losses come through at some point this year and that as unemployment rises that will probably mean that come next january when most people get their pay rises wage growth will be lower than it is at the moment, and that will then help bring inflation pressures down. And we're, look at, we're likely to see, perhaps, or maybe I'll get your opinion on this, another two, maybe 25 basis points moves by the Bank of England. Does this mean that, you know, obviously we're going to go higher and then keep them there for a long time? And then looking out into 2024, which is pretty much globally what investors have been doing right if it, if you look at major risk assets let's say including the FTSE you know investors are looking through going oh forget this year let's look through to 2024 um how do you how do you look at the outlook for monetary policy given what you've just said about mortgages what impacts do you think this is going to have on the economy and markets yeah i don't think that the big question is whether the Bank of England put rates up to four and a quarter, four and a half, it doesn't really matter exactly where the peak in rates is. Because as I said, the big impact for the economy is going to be people who are on fixed rate mortgages at much, much lower levels having to refinance this year at significantly higher levels. And you know whether it's another quarter of a percentage point or half percentage point more is not the big decider. It's going from mortgage rates of you could fix on a five year if you had a decent amount of equity at about 1.2% only 18 months ago. Today, you're looking at a number well north of four. So, and you know, assuming you come onto a tracker, because a lot of people I think are betting that rates will then eventually come down. So that I think is the challenge. It's going to feed through, hit the economy. The big question for the UK, therefore, is not so much where do rates peak, 
but how long do they stay at these elevated levels? And the UK, that matters much more for us here in the UK than it does in, say, most of Europe or the US. Because in the US, you've got the vast majority of people on very long-term fixed-rate mortgages. In Europe, in the key major economies in Europe, most people are on about 10-year fixed-rate mortgages. Whereas here in the UK, there's a lot of people on two-year mortgages uh, and then about half of people on those five-year mortgages. But again, about 20% of the five-year fixes will expire this year. So we've got a much shorter-term mortgage market than in Europe or the US. So the critical question for the UK economy is not so much what, where rates peak, but how long they stay there. And ultimately, that's going to be determined, I think, by when unemployment rises. Uh, and I, if we're right that unemployment does start to rise this year, then the question for the Bank of England is, well, how much confidence can they have that that will bring wage pressure down and inflation down? And because what that's the confidence they really need to be able to then cut rates. Ultimately, I think that if they keep rates at something like 4.5% through this year, it's going to have a significant negative effect on house prices and on the economy as those people who refinance cut back. Um, and that will ultimately lead to a significant enough rise in unemployment that by the time we get into 2024, I do think the Bank of England will feel comfortable that actually the economy has deteriorated enough that they can afford to cut rates. And I actually think that they're probably going to end up having to cut rates by a bit more than the market's currently pricing. So they may put rates up a little bit further than where we are now, but I think they'll ultimately bring rates down more than the market's pricing um, to help the housing market out. You look, for example, at the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors Estate Agent Survey, the price balance component of that survey is very weak now. And I think prices are being propped up at the moment because there's very limited supply. But if they were to keep rates too high for too long, you could get into a very unfortunate situation where some people um, are struggling to afford the house they currently live in as they refinance. And if that were to start to lead to some uh, more significant hit to the economy, then I think you know that's a scenario in which the Bank of England would pretty quickly reverse policy and look to be getting rates back down, as long as unemployment's already gone up and therefore they're less worried about a wage price spiral than they are at the moment. So it sounds like there's a big emphasis from you on the housing sector um, and own, you know, uh, assets that you own as a kind of interest rate sensitivity kind of uh, area because of the wealth effect, right? People, um, their house prices go down, they feel less, you know, uh, the marginal propensity to consume is less. Um, plus, you've got this kind of unacceptable level of 10% inflation, which let's say goes down to maybe five, six, there's probably a risk that it could remain a little bit uh, stickier. Plus, you've got the energy kind of price um, hit consumer confidence. And next winter that I think people are forgetting that hasn't really been sorted out yet. And that's obviously a big, big question. So how does one marry what you've just said about housing and things like that with the performance of the FTSE, for example? So Housing obviously is a is a part of that, um, but to zoom out, we've got probably the worst performing economy in the G7 on a quarterly basis. Even though I, I can't remember which MP it was said that the uh, economy grew four percent from 2021 to 2022, obviously because of the pandemic. How and but we've got the FTSE at all time highs, you know, near there or thereabouts. So given what you've just said about kind of the risks, let's say, going forward, what's your outlook for the, the FTSE and how does that kind of all piece together? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's important to explain why the FTSE is done relatively well in a world where the economic growth outlook is pretty weak. Um, and I think ultimately there's a few reasons for that. One is that if you look at the FTSE All Share, which has got quite a large cap, waiting to it, obviously. Uh, only about 24% of the revenues for the companies listed on the FTSE all share come from the UK. So when you buy UK companies, you're actually getting the bulk of your exposure is to foreign revenues. So what happens in the domestic economy is not the key driving force for the FTSE all share. That said, the outlook for the global economy also, I think, looks quite weak because the same pattern of higher interest rates, slowing down economic growth is happening in most of the major developed market economies. So that on its own 
perhaps explains some of it, but not all of it. The other factors are that sterling has gone down quite a lot. So it's interesting. If you look at the market performance of the FTSE all share in sterling, it's been flattered by the fact that the pound went down and therefore those foreign denominated revenues in pound terms were worth more. But if you go to the lows in October last year, the FTSE all share in dollars was down more than 25%. Uh, and it's still not back at previous highs if you look at it in dollar terms. So part of it's been sterling. The other thing going on is the makeup of the UK market. And I think this is some of this is well understood, some of it less so. If you look at the composition of the FTSE, it's got quite a high exposure to energy sectors, mining as well. Um, and the energy sectors obviously did very well last year as energy prices went up a lot in contrast to other parts of the economy which got hit. So that helped the UK out. The miners, they benefited on optimism about China reopening and how that's going to help commodity demand. So that commodity producer part of the UK economy helped prop up the FTSE when some other bits were doing less well. The other thing to bear in mind is that, and I think this is less appreciated, there's hardly any tech in the UK stock market in terms of market cap. So part of what happened last year was the very expensive tech stocks globally got absolutely whacked. The UK was barely exposed to that because there's very little in terms of market cap weight into the tech sector. And then the other thing is that there's a very chunky weight to consumer staples companies listed here in the UK. Now they're global consumer staples businesses that are listed here in London, and they tend to be more defensive. So again, I think those helped out the market overall last year when it was going down. But if you look beneath the hood of the market, it's not fair to say that the market didn't price any bad news in last year. And that's where I think some of the opportunities are. For example, if we look at some of the retailers, um, at the lows last year, the UK retail sector went down 50% by October from the peak. Now, it's rallied a bit since then, but it's still down, on average, about 20%. So when I look at opportunities in the UK at the moment, I'd be looking at the more domestically focused cyclical stocks, things like some of the retailers, for example, uh, that priced in a lot of bad news last year and have rallied a bit since there, but still offer some value. And, you know, we're being selective within that. You've obviously got to pick the retailers you think can survive the shift to online, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, broadly speaking, it's those more beaten up, domestically focused cyclical stocks, which basically already knew that the recession that we think is coming is coming and priced that in last year and are now not back to their previous highs. So you're kind of um, predicting that the UK economy's outlook will kind of slow or, you know, it's it, it's slow already, but um, you're then looking at those kind of ones that are, have been more materially affected or priced in the bad news last year and seeing that they probably could rally, even if we do see the, mon the long and variable lags of monetary policy hitting the economy further. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that's right. So we called our outlook for 2023 um, a bad year for the economy, a better year for markets, basically on the view that, exactly as you just said, that we're going to get a recession in the major developed market economies this year, but the, the market already knows that and priced it in last year. Now, obviously, the market has rallied a fair way since we published that. We were writing it back in October last year. So the risk reward's a little less attractive than it was back then. But you look at UK stocks, particularly some of the mid and small cap stocks, they're still down a fair way on where they were at the previous peaks. Uh, the market as a whole trades on a P of somewhere around sort of 10 to 11 times, depending on which bit of the market you're looking at. Um, so we do still think that there are opportunities. But as I say, in those more beaten up cyclical parts of the economy, which we think priced the recession in last year, as opposed to the bits that held up very well. It's really interesting. And yeah, I'm glad you kind of brought up valuation here. So how does the FTSE's valuation, given that it's, all, it's the composition is different, of course, because of the lack of technology, how does that look from a risk reward basis versus an emerging markets and obviously emerging markets very broad um but but humor me uh and then again versus the us so how does that kind of valuation entry point look versus other kind of 
uh, ge you know, uh, geographical areas, let's say. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think that you should ever expect the UK stock market to trade on the same kind of valuations that the US stock market is. It doesn't have those fast growing tech companies, at least in a kind of big market cap weighting in them. So I look at the valuations today, the FTSE 100 is trading on a forward P of about 10.8, the mid caps on just below 12, small caps on about 10 and a half. So those are pretty low valuations hit by historic standards, despite the rally that we've seen in stocks over the last few months. So I still think that the valuation backdrop looks quite attractive for UK shares. Um, the issue is, you know, then it's not going to trade on the kind of valuations you see in the US. But I do still think that uh, they're relatively cheap. When you contrast it with somewhere like China, though, I think it's interesting. You know, the Chinese stock market's trading on similar kind of PEs to the UK. But I do think that the long-term growth outlook in China is better than it is here in the UK. So valuations as a whole in the UK look relatively attractive. We think that if you look out over the next decade or so, that good valuation starting point means you probably get returns of around 7% a year on average. Now, that won't be every year, but if you annualize it over the next decade, uh, our long-term capital market assumptions are for about 7% returns for the UK. Um, but somewhere like China that can grow a bit faster and is also on cheap valuations, we think can do a little bit better. But, so, you know, it's still decent returns. But I think probably somewhere like China, where the valuations are low and the growth outlook uh, a little more favorable, might outperform the UK. So that's China, the UK. Where does the US come into this picture, given that We've obviously seen a big uh, rally and it trades at a much kind of, let's say, higher valuation on a relative basis to the UK. How? Would, what's your outlook, maybe five, 10 years for the, for the US in terms of kind of long term um, returns? Yeah, so it's a bit lower than we have for the UK and China, but still positive. Uh, the reason it's a bit lower is that the valuations are a bit higher in the US. But actually, interestingly, if you look at the breakdown of the US market, that's because the more expensive tech growth type stocks, they've gone from what I frankly think was bubble like valuations at the beginning of 2022 down. So they're no longer in that kind of bubble territory, but still quite expensive by historic standards. Um, so that just weighs on our long-term 10 to 15 year expected returns, given that the valuations are still higher than their long run average. But interesting, if you look at some of the cheaper parts of the US market, some of the value stocks, they trade at pretty reasonable valuations, certainly compared with the growth stocks and compared with their sort of long run average valuations. So when I look around the world at Basically, if our view is that we're going to get a recession this year, I'm trying to look at which bits of the market priced that in last year, and then haven't fully rallied so that they're no longer pricing that in. And the opportunities that I see on a global basis are the value stocks in the US, things like the banks, for example, which are still down about 22% from their peak in the US. Some of those more domestically focused mid and small cap stocks in the UK, which again, went down a lot last year, um, have rallied a bit, but are still some way off their highs. And then China, which got absolutely thumped last year, was down sort of 60% from its peak and has rallied, but is still down about 45% from its peak. So I would be looking at those Chinese stocks, the domestic cyclically focused I mean, small cap stocks in the UK and some of the US value stocks like the banks. That's really interesting. And um, just to maybe close this this off, um, looking out into this year and maybe to the end of uh, 24 as well, what are the biggest risks that you see um, for, you know, that we, you can you can pick your poison? Um, but we've got obviously recession, earnings risk that um, Morgan Stanley have been kind of very much calling um, the kind of uh, bell on what are the biggest risks for the markets and risk assets? Is it sticky inflation? Is it that recession? Is it earnings risk? What do you, what's on your radar that maybe keeps you up at night? So 
somewhat counterintuitively, I don't actually think the biggest risk for markets is that we get a recession, because I think that the market expects that. If yeah. you look at um, various indicators, the extent to which the yield curve is inverted, for example, a lot of the leading economic indicators, take the conference board's leading economic indicator in the US, for example, year on year, it's in deeply negative territory. Every time in the past that that's happened, you've got a recession, and obviously the market looks at these indicators. So I think it would be surprising, given the extent to which stocks sold off last year and the weakness in some of those leading economic indicators, if the market didn't already think a recession was coming. Now, admittedly, those consensus sell-side earnings forecasts probably have got a bit further to come down. But if you look at the early 1990s recession as an example, what happened was the stock market went down in anticipation of the recession. And then as the earnings expectations came down, the stock market rallied. And by the time the earnings expectations had bottomed, the stock market was back at a new high. And I think there's a decent chance that that's what's going on at the moment. So it's less a recession that really worries me. What worries me is somewhat counterintuitively, and although, of course, is what I hope for, for kind of people living in the real world rather than investors, I think the biggest risk for investors is if we don't get that recession this year and therefore unemployment stays very low, wage growth stays high, that inflation therefore is stickier. And so the central banks, rather than being able to deliver the rate cuts that the market thinks they're going to deliver by the end of 2024, in fact, rates end up being you know, broadly where they are now, or worst case scenario, significantly higher than where they are now by the end of 2024. Because I think, you know, three things have really dri driven the rally in stocks since October. One of them has been the reopening in China. One of them has been the fact that gas futures prices for next winter have come down materially because it's been a warmer winter. And so the storage levels of uh, gas are much higher than they normally would be at this time of year. But the other thing that's helped markets has been the markets pricing in the actually rates are going to be able to be cut as we head towards the end of 2024. Um, now, if that doesn't happen, that I think is the biggest risk to markets if bond yields were to go higher again. And that in particular, I think, would hit the uh, more expensive growth focused stocks. So, again, that speaks to why I've got a preference for some of the more beaten up bits of the market, the value sectors, particularly in the US, where I think even though that's not the base case, the risk of inflation being a bit more persistent is probably higher in the US than it is elsewhere. Perfect. Well, that's a great way to to end it on a on a positive note. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, we'll have to do this again soon. Thanks for having me.